Hello superstars, I am going to read you part two of chapter two of Stig of the Dump. Now the chapter is called Digging with Stig and if you remember on Friday we got up to the part where Barney was dangling the carrot to Stig. Well, I'm not going to jump this time, said Barney, and this string's too thin to climb down. Going round, he said, making circular movements with his arms. He got off his perch and walked along the way to, round to the top of the pit to the shallow end where he had got out the night before. It was more difficult finding his way to Stig's den along the floor of the pit than it had been finding his way out the night before. The dump looked quite different, more cheerful, with more sunlight pouring down through the golden autumn leaves and the ashen sycamore seeds dwindling down from the trees on top. But the tail of the aeroplane was only part of the farm machine and the ship's helm was a broken cartwheel. The, there was the bicycle too, just a rusty frame with bits of brake hanging onto it. Never mind, he'd found something much more interesting and he'd seen it and spoken to it in a broad daylight, a real live stig. And he was going to visit him. That's if he could find his way among the giant nettles. Suddenly there was Stig coming to meet him straight through a nettle patch as if the stings meant nothing to him. Barney stopped. What now? Shake hands? Rub noses? No, perhaps not. He remembered the apples he had stored inside his shirt, took one out and held it towards the Stig on a palm of his hand as if he was trying to make friends with the horse. I hope you like the carrots, Stig, said Barney. Have an apple. Stig took the apple quite politely between finger and thumb, not between his teeth, as Barney somehow expected him to, and sniffed it. Barney took another apple out for himself and bit into it. Good, he said. Delicious. Stig took a bite. He seemed to like it, smiled, and they both started walking towards the den, munching their apples. Stig just blundered through the nettles, and as far, far as Barney could see, they stung him and raised bumps as they did on other people. But he just didn't care. Barney himself avoided the nettles as much as he could. He got stung once or twice, but decided not to make a fuss about it. Stigs don't mind stings, he thought, so we'd better not. Stig led the, led the way to the den. Barney noticed several dumps of new white chalk near the path and remembered the new tunnelling he had seen yesterday and the baby's bath full of chalk. Been digging, Stig? he asked, pointing to the dumps. Stig grinned and nodded. It was gloomy and overhung at Stig's end of the pit, even on this bright day, and the den itself, now that the hole in the roof was mended, was even darker. The teapot lamp was flickering and throwing a dim light on the den, and the place where Stig had been digging, but it was not very cheerful. Come to think of it, thought Barney, rabbits and things that live in holes don't have light at all. Not much fun for them, with no windows. Couldn't he find some windows for Stig? What made it worse was that Stig had started a small fire in the den part. He must have done it because Barney had not noticed any smoke when he was sitting on the tree trunk. The smoke was filling the den and there was no way out for it except to trickle through the gaps in the roof. It made Barney's eyes water, but he supposed it was one of the things that you just have to put up with, like nettles. All the same, the place could do with the chimney as well as windows. He began to get used to the darkness and he could see that the tunnel at the back of the cave went further back into the chalk than he had noticed. The digging tools were lying about, the bedstead leg, the broken cast iron shoe scraper and an iron bar like the one he'd seen his father use on his jack to lift the car up. Stig was reaching up to offer Barney another turnip, but Barney didn't feel like turnips so soon after breakfast. Can I help you dig, Stig? he asked. I expect you're busy anyhow. He went to the end of the tunnel and picked up a bit of bedstead and began to attack the wall of chalk. It was not easy at all, as he had expected. The chalk in was inside the hill. Here was firm, not crumbly, as it was on the outside, where the rain had got at it. Barney's bashes, with the awkward piece of metal, only broke off smallest chips of chalk, and he was soon puffed. Stick, who had been standing watching him, took the digger out from his hands and showed him how to dig a hollow at the bottom of the chalk wall. Then knocked down large chunks which came away easily because they were not held up underneath. There, soon, was a pile of loose chalk and Barney picked at it with his hands and put it in a small tin bath. When it was full, it was about as much as he could drag along the floor of the cave towards the entrance. Stick helped him and between them they lugged the load out of the den and dumped it. 
but Barney noticed that Stig took care to put it somewhere from his door. He supposed that pals of his new white chalk would let people know that something was going on. Stig let him dig next time. And soon he got the hang of cutting and cutting under and letting it tumble down from the top. Now and then they would come to a great flint embedded in the chalk, like a fossil monster with knobs and bulges, and they would have to chip around it, worry it, and loosen it like a tooth until at last it came free, usually bringing down a lot of chalk with it. They worked on happily for quite a time, taking in turns to dig and load, and now, then, they would stop for a break and take a drink of water from the tin or eat a refreshing apple. Barney's jeans were white with chalk dust and his hair and nails were full of it. He suddenly wondered what his grandmother would say. Then he suddenly wondered what time it was. In spite of the apples, his tummy was telling him that it might be lunchtime. You haven't got a clothes brush, have you, Stig? he asked. Stig looked blank and Barney decided that he probably hadn't. His eye fell on Stig's water pipe. Somebody had thrown away a vacuum cleaner, so there must be one of those brush things somewhere. Sure enough, he spied one, fixed a sort of a tea piece on the end of a long thin pole that was helping to hold the roof up. He thought the roof might hold itself up for a bit while he got the worst of the chalk dust off with the vacuum cleaner end, and it did. Stig was watching with a puzzled look, wondering why Barney should be pulling down part of his roof to brush his clothes with. You look lucky, Stig, said Barney. Nobody asked you how you got in such a mess. I've got to go now. It must be nearly lunchtime. Pity I can't ask you to lunch, but... But really, he thought, nobody else even believes in him yet. I'll be back this afternoon, Barney said from the door. Thanks for letting me help you. Goodbye. Grandmother and Lou were late getting back from town, so he had time to get the chalk out of his nails and hair and to look fairly respectable for lunch. They were too full of talk about how they'd spent the morning to question him much about what he had been doing. Over the stewed apples he was about to say quietly, Granny, have you got any things you don't want? Things I don't want, dear, Grandmother repeated. What sort of things? Chilblains? Grandchildren? No, Granny, I mean things like windows and chimneys. Grandmother thought about this for a moment and then said that she... She couldn't think of anything like windows and chimneys except windows and chimneys and she thought the house had only just enough of these to go round. And Lou just laughed and said, Really, Barney? Then Grandmother said that it did remind her of when some tins and jars had meant to put out for the dustbin, dustbin men and perhaps Barney would be a dear and carry them to the gate. There were more jam jars than Barney had thought possible and quite a lot of useful tins with sort of lids. Barney looked at them. The dustbin man wouldn't say thank you for them, he thought. Why, shouldn't Stig have them? He remembered a big wooden box, which meant that Grandfather had which grandfather had him fix wheels on so that he and Lou could use it as a cart. He searched round and found it along the firewood. But still, with its four wheels more or less straight and a piece of rope on the front to pull it with, he loaded it with jam jars and tins and found it quite a weight when he set off across the paddock with it. He looked at Flash, the pony, as he struggled through a clump of long grass and called rather crossly, you might come and help pull instead of standing there. But he knew that Flash took a lot of persuading to be taught for Lou to ride him, let alone pulling carts. The pony just stood and watched, tossing his head now and then at the afternoon flies. By the time Barney had got his load to the edge of the pit, he was quite tired, but there was still a problem of getting them to the bottom. He sat on the camel's neck tree trunk. The string was still there. It was the thick brown sort and he thought it would be strong enough to, for a few jam jars. He called to Stig and after a time Stig came out backwards like a badger with its bedding dragging a load of chalk. I've got some things for you Stig, Barney called. He pulled up the string and took the end to the pile of jam jars. About eight of them were packed in a cardboard box. It would take too long to pass them down one by one so he tied the string around a box and took it carefully along the tree trunk and started to lower it. This wasn't nearly as easy as the carrots. The box swung wildly, the string round it started slipping. The part he was holding tried to run through his fingers and burnt his hands. He took a turn and turn round the stump of the branch and let it run round that, hardly daring to look at it, look down and see what was happening. He hoped Stig wouldn't get a jam jar on his head. The box was hanging by one corner when it reached the ground, 
but instead of untying it, Stig disappeared into his den. Hey, Stig, undo it, Barney called. There's some more to come. Stig came out again, holding what was left of a large, broad-brimmed lady's straw hat with ribbons to tie it under its chin. He untied the string from the box and tied it to the ribbons. It made quite a useful-looking cargo sling. Jolly good idea, Stig, Barney shouted. Stig's got brains, he thought. After that, it was quite easy. He hauled up the hat, filled it with jam jars, lowered it down with the string running round the stump of the branch, waited for Stig to unload, hold it up again, and so on. When he had finished the jam jars, he started on the tins, which were much lighter, and when he had lowered all the tins, he looked at the truck. How strong is the string? he wondered. Could he send the truck down the same way? If he didn't, he would have to trundle it all the way round the top and along the bottom of the pit. He wound the string round a few times, round the branch stump, leaving enough loose to reach the trunk on the cliff top. Humped himself along the tree trunk, tied the string to a wheel of the truck, moved back along the trunk and pulled the truck towards him by the string. The truck lurched over the edge of the cliff, swung wildly outwards on the string, which ran out so fast that he couldn't stop it. Until the tangling string made it stop with a jerk, the string broke and the truck was falling through the air. Ugh. Barney held on for dear life to the tree, with his face against the mossy bark, and shut his eyes. He felt weak and dizzy. At last he allowed himself to look down. He couldn't see the truck at first. Then he saw that it had swung out onto the land in the branches of an elder tree, and was hanging there quite happily. I've sent the truck down, he called to Stig. It may come in useful. He was feeling what his grandmother used to call hot and cold all over. But he carefully inched himself off the tree and onto the firm ground and set off round and down to the pit. A pity he couldn't let himself down on a rope, but no, he thought, he wouldn't try just yet. His idea of sending the things down on the string had been a good one though. He thought to himself as he walked through the cops. Another day he'd have to find some more tins and jam jars to send down. He hoped stick like them. He will, uh, they will come in useful for, well, things like they always came in useful for, if you keep them long enough. By the time he got to the den, Stig had untangled the truck from the tree and was squatting looking at it, at the tins and the jam jars, and then Barney wondered what he was going to do with them. These are jam jars, Stig, he explained. Jam and marmalade come in them, and you can use them for keeping stuff in them, rice and coffee and things like that. But Stig... But did Stig want to keep rice and coffee in his den? And these are tins. They're empty, of course, but you can get all sorts of things in them. Peaches and baked beans. You have to open them with an opener like this. And he took out, out of his pocket a tin opener, which he usually carried around with him. It was the sort with a butterfly handle, which you had to turn. Just to show he had fitted on the bottom of one of the empty tins and twisted the handle. The opener crept round the edge of the tin, the blade ploughed into the metal at the bottom, and soon the shiny round disc of metal came loose. Stig was fascinated. He looked at the flat round piece of tin which had been at the bottom. He looked at the empty tube which was all that was left of the rest of it. He took the tin opener from Barney and turned the handle, but he couldn't make it out. It's quite easy Stig, look, said Barney. And he took another tin, fitted the opener on the bottom and showed him how to work it. And there was another round plate and another tin tube. And Stig had to have a go, and he started on a third. One of the tins had been rather flattened, but he gave Barney an idea for how it might be used. He took it, left Stig with the others, and towed it in truck into the den, along with, with, to the place where Stig had been digging at the chalk. There was quite a lot of loose rubble lying about, and Barney set to work to shovel it into the truck with the flattened tin. It was certainly better than using his hands, though it wasn't quite the right sort of shovel shape yet. He hammered it at it with an unbroken flint stone and made it into quite a handy scoop, like the sort the village grocer used for shoveling sugar into little paper bags. He toiled away until the truck was heaped full. It held much more chalk than the tin bath, and because of its wheels, he could pull it away quite easily. Look, Stig, he said as he went past where the Stig was sitting. Look at all the chalk. I've loaded. But Stig seemed too busy to notice. Barney wheeled the truck along to the place where they were now dumping the chalk and tipped out his load. Then he ran back to the den, with the truck bouncing along empty behind him. 
When he got back, Stig was sitting there surrounded by plates of tin and empty tubes, tubes and just in the act of taking the bottom of the tin. Of the last tin. Stig, what are you doing? exclaimed Barney. You've spoiled all the tins now. You can't keep things in tins with no bottoms. He was really quite annoyed. What was the use of a lot of tin tubes with no ends? Stig sat there playing with them. He seemed to have an idea of fitting one inside the other, but that wouldn't work because they were all exactly the same size. However, one of them had got a bit pinched that did fit into another, which seemed to please him a lot. Barney thought it was a bit childish of Stig to sit there playing, like a baby with a plastic brick, when there, all that work to do, uh, when there was all that work to be done. But Stig went on seriously worrying over the problem of fitting them together. He found that by pinching together the end of the tin, he could make it fit into the next one. And soon he had four or five fitted together, like a length of stovepipe. Stovepipe, Barney knew, there was something Stig needed badly. You are clever, Stig, he said. You've made a chimney. Stig but blank. He didn't know he needed a chimney. He didn't know what a chimney was. Certainly, he'd made one. But if it hadn't been for Barney, he wouldn't have known. Working together, they fitted all the tins one into another until they had a pipe that was taller than either of them. With Barney directing, they carried it into the smoky den, where it was too long to stand upright. Now all we've got to do is poke it through the roof, said Barney. Stig looked doubtfully at him, but together they managed quite easily to push it through a crack between the piece of linium and a sheet of corrugated iron. But now what? They couldn't just leave it hanging above the fire. I know, exclaimed Barney. The bath! And he left Stig patiently holding the chimney and went and fetched the tin bath. What luck! It had a rusty, rusty hole in the bottom, which only needed a little work with the boot scrape to make it big enough to fit the chimney through. Stig was dimly beginning to see what Barney was trying to do. Together, they built up a fireplace of chalk blocks and big flints, rested the bath upside down on top, and there was the mantelpiece and chimney, with the flue leading from the hole in the upturned bath through the roof and up into the air, open air. Barney lit the fire, which Stig had laid as they built the fireplace, and threw some additional scraps of paper and twigs onto it. Once the smoke had learnt its way, it went roaring up the pipe. They rushed outside and there it was coming out of what looked like a proper chimney pot sticking through the roof. Stig watched, fascinated. There you are, Stig, said Barney. Now you've got a proper fireplace, people can come and visit you without getting their eyes full of smoke. Actually, Stig didn't seem to care very much about having a place full of smoke, but he was pleased with his fireplace, as if it had been his new toy. And he kept on putting twigs and leaves on the fire so that he could go out and see the smoke coming out of the other end. And Barney was so proud of his invention that he looked round for something else to invent. He saw the stack of jam jars. What he had brought those for? It would be too dull just to use them to keep food in. Stig's den wasn't that sort of place. He had to think of a new way of using jam jars. What he had thought Stig's house needed most? A chimney. He got that now. A chimney and yes, a window. A window? Well, windows were made out of glass. And so were jam jars. Yes, but the shape. Doors were made out of wood. And so were clothes pegs. Ships were made out of steel. But so were tin openers. But you can't make a ship out of a tin opener or a door out of a clothes peg. And the shape's wrong. You couldn't hammer glass flat, could you? He picked up the boot scraper. No, of course not. Stig had stacked the jars on top of each other, lying on their sides, but made a sort of wall of glass like that. But they all rolled about, and of course there were gaps between the jars. Barney looked at one side of the den, the darkest side, which really needed windows. It was built of wooden boxes from the dump, bottoms up, outward, open tops inward. He took the digging tool and knocked the bottom out of one. There was now an open square where the daylight came in, but so did the wind, and, Dig and Stig didn't seem at all pleased at sitting in the draught. Stigs liked to be snug, thought Barney. He carried the jars in and stacked them in the frame of the box. He fitted them quite well. The light came in, but the draft came in too. Stig got up and looked at the gaps between the jars, grunted and went out of the den. Barney followed him, wondering. Stig led the way along the bottom of the cliff to where they had been lately, 
where there had lately been a landslide and quite a large chunk of cliff top had come down in one piece. Between the topsoil and the chalk there was a layer of red clay, good damp squidgy stuff you could make model animals with. Stig began to dig lumps of clay with his fingers and Barney found another good clay mine and did the same. They got as much as they could carry and took it back to the den and from the outside Stig set to work to fill the gaps between the jam jars. They had to make two more journeys before all the jars were firmly bedded in clay and then Barney carefully wiped the smears off the bottoms of the jars with a rag. Then they stood and admired their window. They even made faces at each other, one standing inside and the other outside, because you could almost see through it. It certainly let the light in, even though it was late in the afternoon and there was not much light to let in. Well, well, said Barney, that's it. It was a thing he had often heard his grandfather say when he'd finished a job. He was tired after all the inventing he had done and he went to sit down and he saw all around the places of the tin that Stig had cut out lying around on the floor. He gathered them up and they must be used for these too. He went back to the window and found that the disc fitted exactly over the ends of the jars if he pressed them onto to the soft clay. They were just enough to go around. There you are Stig, he said, like on ship to shut the portholes. If you don't want people to look in, or to shut the dark out. There was a feeling in the evening there that the darkness was coming and that it would be snug to sit by the new fireplace and watch the fire going up the chimney. But Barney suddenly remembered something and stood with his mouth open. Stig, he said, I've got to go home. All the way home, I mean. I probably won't be staying with Granny till, till Christmas. Stig looked at him. Stig, said Barney, when I come back again, you... You will still be here, won't you? Stig didn't answer, but he went to a little niche in the chalk walk, poked among some things there and brought back something which he gave to Barney. He looked at it. It was a little chipped flint, perfectly shaped like a flat Christmas tree and very sharp. An arrowhead, Barney gasped. For me? Oh, thank you, Stig. I, I really must go now. See you at Christmas. You will still be here at Christmas, won't you, Stig? Goodbye! And he ran off. As he made his way along the bottom of the pit, he felt he knew there was a way that better than anyone else in the world. And he felt that Stig's house was as much his home as anywhere else. After all, it was like drawing pictures. Once you put a chimney and a window on a house, you've really made a home. And that is the end of chapter two. I know that is a really, really long video for you to watch year three, and I am sorry. What I would like you to do now is I'd like to have a look at the sheet and see what English tasks you need to do today. I think there's something about tell me cards. How exciting. Have a lovely day. See you soon.